by the end of this lesson on covalent bonding, you will be able to describe covalent bonding, make predictions about what will happen during covalent bonding, and also model covalent bonding with some diagrams. So let's talk again about the stability of atoms. Sometimes, in order for atoms to become stable, they form ions and then bond with other ions in ionic bonds. There is another way for atoms to become more stable. Atoms that don't form ions or ionic bonds can instead share electrons in order to get a full valence shell of eight electrons. A bond where atoms are sharing electrons is called a covalent or a molecular bond. This can only happen between nonmetals. So here's a list of all of the nonmetals that can participate in covalent bonds. Notice that hydrogen is on this list, even though hydrogen is on the left hand side of the periodic table, it is considered a nonmetal and makes covalent bonds. So if you look at the periodic table, the area of elements that we're looking at that are going to participate in covalent bonding are over here on the right hand side. So I'm just gonna sort of circle them for you. These are the elements and also hydrogen that are involved in covalent bonding. So let's look at some examples of what exactly this would look like. So chlorine, for example, would love to get together with another chlorine and here's what they do. Remember that only the valence electrons are involved in covalent bonding or bonding of any type actually. Chlorine has seven of them. And if chlorine can't get together with something like sodium, for example, where it can make ions and an ionic bond, the other thing chlorine can do to become more stable is to get together with another atom of chlorine. Since each of them have seven, if together they just share one pair, then they'll each have eight. So this chlorine has its own seven and borrows this one from this chlorine. This chlorine has seven and borrows one from another chlorine. Let's look at one more example, hydrogen and oxygen. You know that oxygen has six valence electrons. And it would really like to have eight. So if it's in the presence of hydrogen, which has one valence electron, here's what can happen. Hydrogen really only needs two. Remember that hydrogen only has one gel and that can only hold two electrons. Hydrogen is going to use its own and then one of oxygens to make a covalent bond. Now this oxygen has seven valence electrons, so it's almost happy. We're going to give it one more hydrogen that has one valence electron of its own. And now oxygen is sharing one with this hydrogen, one with this hydrogen. It has six of its own and that makes eight. Each hydrogen is sharing one with oxygen and it has one of its own, so that makes two. And hydrogen is happy. So the drawings that we just did are called Lewis dot structures. So draw those diagrams for the following two examples. Hit pause and come back and check your answers when you're done. So let's look at bromine first. If you find bromine on the periodic table, you can see that it has seven valence electrons. So all bromine has to do to get a full valence shell is find another one of itself that also has seven valence electrons. And it's just going to share one pair with the other one and now each one of those has eight. Oxygen and fluorine. All right. So oxygen has six because it's in group 16. So it really just needs two more. Fluorine has seven. And it just needs one more. So fluorine and oxygen are gonna share a pair, but oxygen still needs one more. So it's gonna find another fluorine with another seven valence electrons, and it's gonna share a pair with that fluorine. There we go. So this can get much, much more complicated with lots and lots of covalent bonds going on. So here are two more complicated examples. Carbon and hydrogen. If you look at your periodic table, you notice that carbon is in group 14. And remember we said that it didn't really make ions very easily because it would have to either gain four or lose four, which is really tough. So carbon is a pro at covalent bonding because it can make so many of them. It's going to bond 
to four hydrogens. And it's going to share a pair of electrons with each one of those hydrogens. So here's a covalent bond, here's a bond, here's a bond, and there's a bond. Each hydrogen has two in order to have a full valence shell, and carbon now has two, four, six, eight to have a full valence shell. What about carbon and chlorine? This is almost an identical situation. This carbon has four of its own. So really, it wants to bond four times. And chlorine likes to bond once to get a full valence shell. Each chlorine, I'm going to do this fast, has seven. So when carbon bonds with four chlorines, it now has four covalent bonds and a full valence shell. Chlorine bonds one time with each carbon, and now chlorine has a full valence shell. So that's another way that atoms can achieve some stability by sharing pairs of electrons in covalent bonds to make a full octet or a valence shell that has eight valence electrons. So remember the difference between ionic and covalent bonding. In an ionic bond, electrons are transferred from one element to another, from one atom to another, to make an ion, and then the ions are attracted to each other. This is very different than what happens in a covalent bond. Atoms are sharing pairs of electrons to make a full valent shell in a covalent compound. So for the following examples, we're going to determine if an ionic bond will be formed or if a covalent bond will be formed. So our first example is sodium and chlorine. If you look at the periodic, so sodium is way over here on the left and chlorine is way over here on the right-hand side of the periodic table. Since sodium is a metal and chlorine is a non-metal, these guys are going to transfer an electron from sodium to chlorine. They're going to become ions and then make an ionic bond. So sodium and chlorine are going to make an ionic bond. What about oxygen and fluorine? Oxygen is over on the right-hand side and so is fluorine. They're both non-metals. So they're not going to transfer an electron from one to the other. They're going to share a pair of electrons in a covalent bond. So oxygen and fluorine are going to make a covalent bond. How about aluminum and bromine? Aluminum is sort of towards the right-hand side here. But remember that the line that separates the metals from the nonmetals is right about there. And aluminum is actually a metal. Bromine is definitely a nonmetal. So aluminum and bromine are going to make an ionic bond. Hydrogen and oxygen. This one is a little tricky. Hydrogen is way over here, but you know that hydrogen is actually a nonmetal. And oxygen is over on the right hand side, also a nonmetal. So hydrogen and oxygen will make a covalent bond. And last one carbon and sulfur. Carbon is over here in group 14. And sulfur is also a nonmetal, so they're going to share some pairs of electrons and make a covalent bond. So here are some examples for you to do on your own. Hit pause, come back and check your answers. All right, potassium is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal. So these guys are going to transfer electrons and have an ionic bond. Carbon and chlorine are both non-metals on the right-hand side of the periodic table. So they're going to share electrons in a covalent bond. Oxygen and sulfur are also both nonmetals on the right hand side of the periodic table. So they're going to share in a covalent bond. And finally, iron and bromine. Iron is in the middle of the periodic table, but it's still a metal. Remember, it's a transition metal that we talked about in the last lesson. Bromine is a nonmetal on the right hand side. So they are going to make an ionic bond. So a couple more questions for you to answer. What's the difference between an ionic compound and a covalent compound? And also which electrons are involved in bonding? So hit pause and come back when you've written down your answers. Alright, the difference between an ionic bond 
and a covalent bond or an ionic compound and a covalent compound is that in ionic compounds, electrons are transferred, that's the key word, transferred from one atom to another. And then those atoms are now ions. They have opposite charges and they're attracted to each other. In a covalent compound, pairs of electrons are shared between nonmetals. And then which electrons are involved in bonding? It's just the valence shell electrons. So now you are able to describe covalent bonding, make predictions about which pairs of elements make covalent bonds, and also model covalent bonding by drawing some pictures.